Well, we are back. That was exciting, wasn't it? We uh, told you in the beginning that this is a inaugural event. We're all guinea pigs here, and obviously so are you, but seems that we've got our technical difficulties sorted out. So we'll pick up where we left off when Mike was telling us about the fact that he uses eight devices for professional purposes. I'm very curious to know what those devices are. And uh, if you could pick up where you left off, please. Sure. So um, I have an, uh, an iPhone, a, uh, a Galaxy um, Nexus phone, uh, two MiFi devices, uh, a tablet, and, two, and a, a laptop and a, and a desktop. Wow. Um, and these are spread out over um, home office as well as uh, the corporate office. Okay. Um, part of the reason that, I mean, most users I don't think need multiple phones for business. Um, the reason I need, I need both platforms is because I, part of what I do is I write um, uh, mobile applications. So I need to test them on at least something other than, than iOS. Okay. Um, but you're a power user. I'm a power user. So that's yeah, not absolutely. exactly and typical. Yes, exactly. Okay. And what about you, Greg? What's your number? Uh, I probably have about five mobile devices, a uh, couple of smartphones, different tablets, laptops. And it's primarily so that I get a feel for what my users are using so we have an opportunity to kind of do testing in the field and know how things will react. Okay. Uh, primarily for my boss. She's a, she thinks she's a power user very often, so I have to have what she has <laughs> so that I can keep up with her. Well, uh, okay, but there, so there are a lot of users that are bit um, forward thinking, they or they might just be flat out tech junkies who want the latest, greatest thing. But on average, how would you say your your usual user, how many devices are they running around with right now? And when I say that, I'm including things like desktops. I'm not just talking about mobile devices, and I'm talking about both corporate issued devices and personal devices that they might be using for personal uses, I'm sorry, for business uses, whether you say they can or not? Well, uh, we find that students, for the most part, are almost all laptop oriented or mobile oriented. We have very few students any longer that have desktops. Uh, can't be very portable lugging around your iMac or your, your, your tower. Uh, we provide desktops to all of our staff and faculty and they primarily use those. So our challenges are when they bring their own devices in that are less controllable. Right. Uh, but for the most part, students probably have at least two or three devices, plus their gaming devices and the other devices that they use that are all wireless now or all require right. some sort of an IP address. Wow. What about your users at CBS? I'd agree with that. I would say that um, most, of, most of our employees, you know, they are, um, even if it's just accessing webmail. Um, we know that they're accessing um, you know, corporate content from personal devices. Um, everyone has, you know, will, will either have a, a, a personal smartphone that they sometimes use for business purposes if they can. Uh, CBS, we happen to, to uh, we have a policy against that, so, mm -hmm. so you do have to have a, uh, a corporate sanctioned device. Um, mm -hmm. And but, does that actually work? Well, it does work at, at certain at a certain level, that, that control, um, we base it off of the, the device's um, uh, UDID. So you can't connect a device that you haven't already, uh, that you haven't um, gotten approved um, okay. to, to certain things, to, to, to exchange specifically. Um, for accessing things like VPN, th there, are, there are different controls. Um, okay. Well, so just overall, generally speaking, what challenges would you say um, is this proliferation of devices causing? What are your major pain points if you had to focus on just a few? Well, from my perspective, it would be our wireless infrastructure certainly gets much more use than it, than it ever did before because there's so many different types of devices. Hmm. From a security perspective, it becomes a challenge because we have to be able to control the access of all those different devices. And the manufacturers of network access control have kept up with laptops but they really don't have clients yet that are available in many cases for all the different mobile devices, so that's a challenge. Uh, and we have problems with security also. You know, we, if they are using it for corporate data, we have to come up with methods and strategies to be able to wipe data and locate those devices if they are lost or stolen. So those all become challenges that we have to deal with. And are you more worried about uh, corporate data? Are you also worrying about any kind of intellectual property, because I know that at, at FIT in particular, there are a lot of 
new projects getting started that students and and uh, faculty wouldn't want to lose track of. Yeah, there is some corporate data and there is also the intellectual property is also an issue. So we have to, and we do this for laptops very well, there's technology for doing that, but it's mm -hmm. much more difficult now as manufacturers create more of the mobile work, de no, work device technologies that we can do those things to, but it's a challenge because we have to support all different types of devices and there's not always the technology to support all those different devices because okay from a school perspective, we can't have the same level of control that a corporation may have, so we have to be more open. Interesting, right, I mean sometimes you're gonna have a great solution for one kind of device which doesn't support all the other devices, and I'm sure for some devices there just aren't good products out at all yet. Right. And Mike, from your perspective, what are your main pain what, points? Well, I th so I think the MDM solutions you know, go part part of the way towards securing general mobile devices. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that uh, over the next few years, those solutions will mature. Um, and whether they go a kind of a sandboxed route or um, hooking into the, the operating system and, and just making the operating system better, um, you know, it remains to be seen. From a, from a challenge perspective, certainly security is the big challenge. Mm -hmm. I think there's also the kind of a, a different side of that, which is, if you, the, the iPad specifically is a great device to enable um, business users to work on the go. And to not have applications because, um, because you, you feel that the, the, the ecosystem can't be properly secured or if you, don't, if you don't address the challenges head on, you wind up saying no. And when you say no, Either they're going to try to do it anyway and they're going to get around, <laughs> or, or they're really not going to do it and you're going to lose that productivity. And so you really do have to look at it as a, the, the, the risk of um, the, the occasional incident versus the risk of the continued loss in productivity. Um, and that's, right. I don't think there are good numbers either way, so it's a kind of black magic to come up with. It's going to be what, different what? for, risk assessment's going to be different obviously sure. for every, everybody. Sure. Um, but Mike, I believe that you said that CBS is already working on a tablet strategy, whatever that means. Can you tell us what that <laughs> sure, means? Sure, sure. So, um, so first of all, um, a, a lot of everything that I'm saying, this is kind of my personal viewpoint. This isn't official Disclaimer. CBS strategy. Disclaimer. <laughs> um, beyond that, what uh, what I'm working on is is a um, is rather than a tablet strategy, it's more of a mobile application strategy. Um, it's focused ma mainly around, around mobile because around tablets because the iPad is kind of the, was the game changer and, mm -hmm. and still is, um, and the 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 core part of that strategy is go HTML5. Don't write native uh, apps unless you absolutely need to. Uh, and the reason for that, you know, if you think about it, um, just about all of the mobile uh, mobile devices and tablets now support most of HTML5. And as that standard evolves, you're going to get closer and closer to a native app experience. Um, right now, HTML5, it's very difficult um, on, on most devices to get access to things like the camera or um, sending SMSs directly or anything like that. Um, I think that those integrations will come um, pretty soon. Um, th there will still be places where a, a, a native app is necessary. So. I want to say never, um, but have the default be HTML5, in which case when a new flavor of the month comes out um, and it's may maybe, you know, Android will have a, a killer tablet mm -hmm. at some point. You don't want to have to say, well, I've just invested all this money and, and time in iOS development. Um, the cross-compiling frameworks like PhoneGap um, certainly go uh, a long way towards making that easier. Uh, but at the end of the day, a lot of that is still, you're still writing a web application. You're just packaging it inside of, a, of an app. Right, um, so you're, you're, you're not just thinking about the devices themselves. You're really thinking about the applications, both from your internal user standpoint and also thinking about what your external customers might be working with. Right, and, and from a corporate perspective, any, any company like, like CBS, you know, I think, needs to draw a line between... Um, you know what we do for employees and and internal folk versus what we can do externally. You know, f for instance, for internal folk, um, you know, 
uh, use of Android in a corporate network um, is there's been a lot of um, research and, and press lately about the the insecurities of, of the Android platform um, mm -hmm. and and the, the ability for you know, to spread malware and, and because it's not a walled garden like the Apple ecosystem is um, the, the challenge that presents we're not going to tell our viewers and our, our external users um, you know that they can't use their Android device to watch a CBS show um, and, and frankly there's very little risk for CBS to even think about that um, so on the external side we want everybody to use every device and, and <laughs> the challenge is to support every device um, right internally we can be a little bit more selective about about which devices we support now, Greg, getting back to you, you have a pretty, uh, uh, let's say, a pretty complex environment. Definitely have a lot of different players and a lot of different devices. Um, I think one of the particularly interesting things about FIT is that a large percentage of your faculty are adjunct professors. Mm -hmm. It's not just full-time staff. Right. So how does, that, um, how does that impact your multiple device strategy, if at all? Well, we provide desktops in office areas for adjunct faculty to use, but for the most part, they all bring their own devices. Mm -hmm. They have to use our corporate email system, the school's email system, and the school's file storage systems. What has happened, though, I think with the pr uh, proliferation of all the cloud storage, very often consumers now are using all of these other solutions for storage, <laughs> and you lose control over those things. So that becomes a challenge of how do we now help a faculty member who uses Dropbox instead of the school's storage strategy for storing his information when students can't access it. So it becomes a challenge not so much for the device itself, but more for how they use that device in, in supporting curriculum and the pedagogy. All right, and I know that a lot of professors are trying to, and are being encouraged to use more technology in their classrooms to keep up with what their students want to do. Right. I, I think one of the things we're finding, one of the cliches that the president of the school mentions that students come out of the womb knowing how to text. <laughs> That's become an inherent you know, ability with students now. So their expectations is everything is multimedia, everything is real time, everything is information when they need it. And they almost have to be entertained in class. It's no longer just lecture. So we look at all different types of technology that help enrich that whole teaching and learning experience. And there's a big push to get faculty more engaged with the use of technology because there's still lots of faculty who don't use email. So we have to work it's with those faculty and spend a lot of time with faculty development because their job necessarily isn't to use the technology, it's to teach a student how to do a particular practice or a discipline. So there's while this technology is prevalent, getting faculty to embrace it is becoming a challenge. And then having them know a little bit more than the students is a challenge. Mm -hmm. And then updating curriculum is a challenge. So all these things kind of continue to, to blend together and it makes it for a very challenging environment. It certainly sounds like it is. Um, uh, briefly, do either of you have a bring your own device policy, an official bring your own device policy yet? And if not, are you working on one. Well, I believe our policy is that there is no policy, that, that you, you, you may not <laughs> bring your own device. No. It, okay. It's just a big no. It's corporate devices. Okay. Yeah. What about you? And we're the opposite. I mean, there is no policy. We, we support everything because it's very difficult to tell, again, our constituents they can't use a particular device that they own. What we do tell them is, here are the applications and solutions that we have. We'll try and help you use your particular device with that application. But we take ownership of the network and the environment, the infrastructure. So we draw the line at providing levels of support, but we don't really draw the line at what devices they use to request that support. Right. I guess it's, again, this question of control, how much you actually have, how much you want, how much you think you have, how much you have to just suck it up and, just, and admit that you're never going to have back again. Um, is that fair to, to say, that that's a Absolutely. major problem? Right. I mean, one, one good example that I could give is we had some programs that use sophisticated proprietary software. 
And in the past, it always had been installed on FIT-issued laptops to students, and that worked very well. But some of the faculty wanted to enlarge the program. So they, they were asking the IT department to install this software on personal laptops of students. Mm -hmm. And it caused all kinds of problems, up to and including corrupting hard drives and, and, and you know, corrupting right. data. So we stopped that practice, but that was an example of a mobile device you know, needs to be loaded and installed properly to use some of these different packages. So the same kind of holds true for some of the tablets and smartphones. Software that normally runs in a classroom and possibly in a corporate environment will not run properly or doesn't get rendered well on the portable devices. So, so you that's going to really increase your, um, it's going to be a challenge for your support people. Right, it is a challenge, and in our case, we very often have software that matches the industry, and it can't be ported to another device because it's not there yet. Gotcha, okay. Huh. That sounds complicated. <laughs> All right, we're getting to that time where we need to wrap up. So if you were going to give one piece of advice to the fine people out there about mobile device, ma not mobile, multiple device management, what would that one piece of uh, advice be? Focus on the long game. Uh, Apple is the, the, the king right now in terms of tablets. Uh, Android has 50%, somewhere around 50% of the market share um, in smartphones. Um, so five years from now, I mean, five years ago, no one heard about uh, an iPad. Five years from now, who knows? Don't bet on specific um, platforms. Don't bet on specific vendors, um, focus on standards, uh, which is, you're going back to my HTML5 comment before, um, and, and focus on MDM. I mean, MDM, I, I think it, it, there's no, really no way around it. You need a centralized way to, um, to manage multiple devices. Not, and so MDM meaning multiple devices, not mobile devices. Um, you need a, 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 the, the same way that uh, that Bez is great for managing a BlackBerry infrastructure. Um, you need the same thing for every device, whether it's a laptop, desktop, mobile device, Google Glasses, um, <laughs> you know, anything. By Bez, if, I assume Sorry. you all know this, but it means BlackBerry Enterprise Server, which can support a variety of mobile platforms, but there are also a few um, very important ones that Bez can't handle just yet. And Greg, what's your advice? I would agree with Mike and you know his comments, but I would say be agile, be adaptive, mm. and create a strategy that supports being agile and adaptive because you can't really anticipate what the next trend will be. But I think the goal is to build an infrastructure and associated policies that can help you manage that as it, as it comes because very often you don't know what the next technology is until it shows up on your doorstep. And you have to do that, so read a lot, be as, engage as you can with what's going on in the world and assume it's going to be hitting your doorstep very soon. Yeah, whether you like it or not before you're ready for it. Well, right. thank you both so much. At this point, I'm going to pick up one of my multiple devices and talk to our executive <clears throat> editor, Kurt Franklin, who is out there somewhere. Um, Kurt has been helping me out by going through the feed and picking out some questions that are of particular interest. Um, so let me find them. Okay, we have one from Timor. Will we be moving away from an app-based environment to a web-based web -based one if HTML5 gets adopted widely? Anybody have thoughts? That's a great question. Um, I don't think we're going to move away from it. Uh, at least not in the short term. While I think that th there are certainly plenty of apps, let's just say in the Apple App Store, uh, that could be implemented just as well in HTML5, or many that are implemented in HTML5 and then just wrapped um, before being put in the, in the, in the App Store. Um, I think there is a, a value of, of marketing um, you know, behind getting your your application in that ecosystem um, that you don't get by just telling people go to my website and you, you can view my app. Um, so the, my, my comments on HTML5 being the way to go, 
uh, I stand by them for corporate applications. Okay. When you're developing an, a, a mass audience facing application, I think marketing trumps um, dollars spent sometimes. So you have, to, you have to weigh things and say, well, d does it make sense to, um, to go purely HTML5, to go HTML5 with a wrapper, to go native app? Um, you know, there's a whole different set of criteria that need to go into that decision. Gotcha. Um, okay, we've got another one here from Joe Stanganelli. If a company has a corporate sanctioned only or corporate issued only devices policy, you still might expect that you can't get 100% enforcement. And if an unsanctioned device with company data gets lost, stolen or otherwise compromised, how can the organization most effectively encourage employees to come forward and admit that they had a security breach? I like that question. <laughs> so it's not just, we've talked a lot about security, we've talked about compliance, we've talked about um, users being a little shy, let's say, about um, being honest with you. When you pull all those things together, what are we talking about? But that is a challenge, having people come forward when they do lose a device and admit it so that we can take some action. As I mentioned earlier, we can locate and wipe data from laptops. It's more difficult to do that with tablets and smartphones, although we can do that. But if we don't know about it, we certainly can't take any action against it. So other than maybe checking phone records and seeing that a call has been made from outside of the New York area, there's not a whole lot you can do if you don't know about it. Sounds like a lot of work. <laughs> it is. Mike, anything else to add? I would just, just add to that that that's, you know, fraud detection systems and, and taken more generally, um, you know, intrusion detection, you know, they, they, these things can, can help detect events like that. Um, I think there's, I, I would say probably a legitimate fear on, on a lot of you know, users' parts that, oh my God, I lost my laptop. Like, I, I, well, what's going to happen? Like, they're going to fire me? What? Right. And I think maybe the, the message from, you know, from corporate should be, um, we're not, we don't want to fire you because you lost your laptop. We know that this, this stuff happens, um, but we really want to be able to wipe the laptop before right. it, it winds up on eBay. Right, and there's a related question here. Um, how can companies make sure that their data is safe when you do allow, um, when you do have a bring your own device policy, which isn't just a flat no, but it's actually, a, yeah, you can use some of these. Would you say that that requires more application level security, more um, security policies or, and, and tools directly on the data, or what? Maybe well, putting more I would say certainly up to date AV, an AV, <clears throat> AV that's being updated on these corporate laptops that go into environments that are outside the, the office place. Certainly VPNs and other you know, secure tunnels, <clears throat> you can get to the data. I would also caution, and this happens very often, at least where I work, that corporate laptops get taken home and then those employees let their kids <laughs> use those laptops and devices. And then you've lost lots of control because they're no longer going just to school or corporate websites. They are now going to anywhere they want and pulling down malware and spyware. So the AV is critical but also maybe paying attention to what your kids are doing with that corporate laptop or corporate smartphone. Using it for online gaming and things like that. Okay. Oh, go ahead. I, I think it's also important to, to limit the, the actual sensitive data that's on the device. If it's not on the device, it, it's, it, it's hard to lose it. Um, <laughs> so, you know, a, a, as we move collectively away from thick applications to, to web-based applications, um, you, know, you still have certain issues with caching and, and stored mm -hmm. passwords and things like that, but you're not, um, you're not dealing with the, the amounts of mass information that, that get lost when a, you know, a spreadsheet containing everyone's you know, Everybody's stuff social security number gets, gets stolen out of a car or yeah. something like that. Yeah. <laughs> right. Okay, well, um, I think that that's about all the time we have for questions. I'll give you one more. Five years from now, average user, how many devices is he going to be using for business use, including things like gaming systems or whatever unforeseen things we've got coming in the next five years? Give me a number. 
I'm gonna say two. I'm gonna go really low on this. The reason is because I think it's it's not gonna be the device. I'm gonna I'm gonna come in, I'm gonna put my whatever whatever the device will be called, my glasses or my phone or whatever, next to a monitor and my desktop appears. And and that and that becomes my device. And I walk away and I put it in front of another monitor and that's my device. Or I so I carry all of my devices kind of virtually mm -hmm. with me, and it's less about the the form. Now, you'll always have users that want um, to you, that want the tablet size experience. I think, um, in which case, you know, there'll be those. But I think most users, um, the the device itself will become less important. So instead of people walking around with the Batman kind of utility belt, they're going to be using a lot How of client-side virtualization. Okay. Greg, what's your I'd probably prediction? agree with, I think, probably two. I would, I would say a phone and some sort of tablet device. As, as more applications move to the cloud and they come, become web-based, it's less about the processing power on the device and more about what's going on in the web. So I, I suspect the large monitor probably becomes a differentiator. If you're doing something with intense spreadsheets or doing any sort of graphic design, mm -hmm. you can't do those on the small devices very easily, so you do need a larger monitor. So that may be the one thing that kind of causes people to be more central as opposed to mobile. Interesting. All right, well, that is all the time that we have today. Thank you all so much for joining us, especially those of you who created Facebook accounts just to participate in this. You know who you are. Thank you very much. Thank you for sticking with us through our unforeseen technical difficulties. Thanks to Dell and Intel for sponsoring this event. And obviously, thanks to Greg Chotner and Mike Scovetta for being our guests. And we hope that you will join us next time. Thanks.